This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, Cardiovascular Grand Rounds. Again, just want to start off and make sure to thank everyone for all their help with our, uh, our holiday uh, toy drive. Uh, we were able to support 110 kids this year. Those were all delivered last year, and it was everything from diapers to winter coats to books to uh, uh, Star Wars superhero figurines and things like that. So uh, that was all delivered last week, uh, and the kids will be getting them this week and the week after. Um, so again, thanks all so much for, for everyone for their help. And, uh, but again, welcome to Cardiovascular Grand Rounds. This morning we have uh, Dr. Rob Cole, who did his medical training, his residency, and his fellowship all here at Emory, and is now an associate professor in the Division of Cardiology, is one of our outstanding heart, advanced heart failure and transplant specialists, and recent recipient of a FAME grant for, uh, from the Department of Medicine to expand his research program. And he's going to talk to us about racial disparities and heart transplant outcomes. Rob, welcome. All right. Thanks, Dr. Taylor. I'm a little embarrassed. It's my, I guess, started my seventh year here, and I've never given cardiology grand round. So um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk. And uh, um, as many of you know, sort of a 100% clinical guy, um, but more recent years have really uh, gained a lot of interest in a variety of heart transplant related research. So uh, I'll have an opportunity to present some of the stuff I've been working on uh, that led to the FAME grant that Dr. Taylor spoke about. Um, it's sort of an appropriate timing to talk about transplant. Um, some of you may know, but this uh, past December 3rd uh, was the 50th anniversary of the first heart transplant uh, performed at this hospital here. Is this a little mouse? I can use the mouse? Okay. Uh, this hospital here in South Africa by Christian Barnard. This is Groot Schur Hospital. It's a nice scenery, as you can see here. Um, and that was December 3rd, 1967, and obviously we've come a long way. Uh, after that first transplant, there were about 100 transplants the next year, and then basically um, no one did anything for 20 years. The problem was around that time, the median survival was one week. And so uh, in general, it was thought that transplant, heart transplant was a failure and would never take off. But obviously, here we are today, 50 years later, talking about it. And yeah, interestingly, race played uh, an interesting role in that first transplant. Obviously, this was in South Africa during apartheid a lot of uh, racial discord, and Christian Barnard, it said, wanted to do the transplant on a young African, or a young black uh, patient that he had at the hospital there. Uh, he felt that this patient was a, a, a good candidate because aside from his heart disease, he was actually very healthy, had no other major problems other than a dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, but the hospital administration, as they want to do, stepped in and said, absolutely not. If we perform a transplant on this young man, he dies it'll be seen as an experimentation. And so they said, we're not going to transplant a black patient. Uh, and they went on to transplant a white patient, Louis Wyshkansky, who had a lot of comorbidities uh, and survived about 18 days. So even back then, race played an important role in, in decision making uh, around the first transplant. Uh, I hope you all survived the fabulous winter. I actually gave a similar talk in January in Detroit after one of our other blizzards and and this was pretty entertaining, but uh, Dr. Sperling and I were here holding down the fort. Dr. Sperling was bragging about how he walked into work every morning, just so you know. Um, one thing about if you ever make it to South Africa, at the Grootshire Hospital, there's a whole wing of the hospital dedicated to the first transplant, and there are a lot of creepy uh, sort of fake humans and statues around the hospital. There's even an operating suite where you can see them performing the first heart transplant. And here's Dr. Barnard in his office. Um, one of my medical students that works with me actually went and, and took a lot of pictures to share with me, which was sort of interesting. Um, so before we start, I think it's important, I have two disclaimers about what we're going to talk about. Uh, the first is about race. Obviously, you know, we're going to be spending an hour talking about uh, black versus white uh, in terms of transplant outcomes, but it's important to realize that race is really not a true biologic classification, right? It's a social construct. 
Uh, we're labeling people based on the color of their skin, and obviously that's not a biologic classification. Uh, some evidence to support that, if you look, there's actually greater genetic variation within self-reported ethnic groups than between them. Uh, another interesting point, back in the 2000 U.S. Census, over 7 million people identify themselves as more than one race, um, making racial classifications even less uh, pertinent. And then I like this quote from an editorial uh, in the New England Journal now over 15 years ago. After 400 years of social disruption, geographic dispersion, and genetic intermingling, there are no alleles that define the black people of North America as a unique population or race. So uh, with that being said, we're going to go on and talk about uh, race as if it's a biologic classification. I will say, obviously, there are uh, there tend to be grouping of certain types of alleles and genetic predispositions to disease. If you take, for example, uh, the AHEFT study, which is a nice example of this, AHEFT was a pioneer trial on heart failure that showed that BIDIL or hydralazine isosorbide could greatly improve outcomes in African Americans with heart failure. The inclusion criteria in that study was self-identified black race. And so clearly there is some merit to to classifying patients, although it is imperfect uh, at best. The other disclaimer uh, is that research in heart transplant is actually pretty pitiful. Uh, and it's inherently difficult to do research uh, because when you consider there's anywhere from two to 3,000 transplants performed a year in the US, and that's spread across over 140 centers, you can imagine uh, there's very little collaboration between centers. And so on average, each center performs about 20 transplants a year. And no one seems to want to talk to each other. Everyone has their own way of doing things, and their way is the best. Uh, and so almost all studies that we see in transplant are single-center retrospective reports. Uh, I had the opportunity to review abstracts for this year's uh, international transplant meeting, ISHLT. And of the 80 or so abstracts, probably 79 were single-center reports, uh, looking at maybe 50 to 100 patients. Uh, so basically, transplant research comes in two flavors, either these sort of single center retrospective reports of 100 patients or these huge registry analyses. So UNOS, United Network for Organ Sharing, actually keeps a database of all transplants performed in the U.S., and they're up to upwards of 40,000 since its origin. And so the other sort of flavor of research is, you know, these large retrospective reviews of, of the data that they collect. And I will say they leave out a lot of important details. And so you have to take those with a grain of salt. But you'll see some of the studies I'm talking about. It's basically either a large UNOS registry uh, or a single center study. And you'll get to see our own single center retrospective data as well. Um, so the purpose of the talk, we're going to start by going over some of the background in terms of where we are with racial disparity, both in the US and at Emory. Uh, we'll review what's sort of out there in the literature in terms of what's been proposed for why outcomes differ by race. Uh, and show sort of why uh, these things probably are not true. And then I'm going to show you some of the data that I've been working on, which suggests that the development of antibodies to the donor heart may play uh, an important role in racial disparity post-transplant. And then we'll talk about sort of some of my next steps and goals. Uh, here's the first heart that you can see at Grootshire Hospital, FYI. Um, out on display. This was transplanted into Louis Washkansky, as I mentioned, and he survived 18 days. Um, so, as you're aware, if you've uh, worked anywhere around Emory, the number of heart failure patients uh, are growing uh, exponentially. And with that, we're seeing a lot of very advanced disease, stage D disease. And as you know, the treatment options are limited. Basically, we have home inotropes, we have transplant, we have assist devices. And of course, we have palliative care. Uh, and if given the option, I think anyone would argue that heart transplant is really the gold standard in terms of long-term survival uh, and better outcomes. You can see here, uh, as of 2013, uh, the median survival after transplant is about 11 years. And if you make it through that first year, your average conditional survival is about 14 years. So patients are doing really well, especially when you consider uh, during that first year in the 60s, the median survival was one week. Of course, the problem with transplant is simple economics. It's supply and demand mismatch. Um, it's estimated that there's probably about a quarter of a million patients in the U.S. that in theory could be candidates for transplant. Unfortunately, as you can see here in green, the number of transplants performed in the U.S. across the last 20 or 30 years 
has not changed appreciably in the 2200 to 2500 range. Um, it's led to some interesting quotes. Lynn Stevenson, who's now at Vanderbilt, says, treating heart failure uh, with transplantation is like treating poverty with a lottery, because really it's almost like winning the lottery to get a transplant. And the other quote that I like is that transplant is really uh, epidemiologically inconsequential when we're talking about heart failure therapies. That being said, for the sickest patients, it does uh, obviously improve outcomes. Uh, I would point out one caveat to this slide. It stops at 2011. Interestingly, the last five years, the number of transplants has risen. Uh, and over the, the last year's data, there were over 3,000 transplants a year. And that's tied largely to uh, the op opioid epidemic as more and more young people are dying of anoxic brain injury related to overdose. So we have, in theory, 3,000 hearts for 100,000 to 250,000 patients. Um, because of that, we really have to reserve these uh, hearts for the patients that are going to benefit the most. And when we have patients do poorly, especially if there are certain populations that do poorly, it can have obviously a devastating impact, obviously on the individual and his family, but also on transplant centers. You know, we're held to a pretty high standard such that if our outcomes are inferior to the rest of the country, our program can be shut down. Uh, so it's important to sort of recognize if there are populations that might be at higher risk for poor outcomes. And what you should take home from this is that across the board, African American transplant recipients are a subgroup that have consistently worse outcomes compared to Caucasian transplant recipients. What do I mean by that? Well, here's two examples of large UNOS registry database analyses. Uh, the first is here from the Hopkins group now, I guess seven years ago, looking at over 20,000 patients. I looked at survival post-transplant by race, and you can see here in the dotted line, this is uh, the African-American group, clearly with inferior survival. Uh, and that survival seems to change somewhere around the first year. Everything sort of goes along nicely, and then after the first year, things start to split. When it was looked at in a multivariable model with over 25, 30 variables, uh, African-American race was associated with about a 46% increased risk of death in follow-up. And these results are unchanged after you censor for the first year. So it's not something that happens early transplant. There's something that happens sort of in that one to three year time frame whereby African-Americans seem to fall off the curve, so to speak. This was followed up a year later by an even larger UNOS registry database analysis looking at almost 40,000 patients, again showing African-Americans somewhere around one year start to have worse survival. Uh, and in this multivariable model, again, a pretty significant uh, difference. Why is this particularly pertinent to us? Well, if you look at the U.S. population here in the Southeast, there is a high percentage of African-Americans uh, living in the Southeast. You can see in the dark blue here, including Georgia, uh, over 13.6% of the population is here. And if you look within Georgia, uh, the, there's about 30% African-Americans uh, in Georgia. The metro Atlanta area is about 32%, and actually the city of Atlanta is about 54% African-American. So uh, it's incredibly pertinent to our patient population here. If you look at our transplants over the last 30 years, uh, this line in blue here is the total number of transplants performed. You can see there's been a nice steady rise since 2002. Uh, and then if you look at it by race, you can see the number of African Americans receiving transplant at our center really since 2005 has steadily increased such that we actually transplant more African Americans now than we do Caucasian or other races. And over the last five years, 60% of our transplants uh, are African American. And compare that to the national average, which is about uh, 21 or 22%. So we transplant about three times as many African Americans uh, as the national average. And I think that's an important point uh, there is no center in the U.S., probably or the world, that transplants as many African Americans as we do, certainly proportionally. Uh, and because of that, I think it's an opportunity, but also um, really uh, a must that we actually try to figure out why uh, these patients are having worse outcomes. When we look at our own outcomes uh, post-transplant, and this is actually censored for patients who did not survive the first 30 days, uh, you can see clearly survival overall is worse in the black transplant recipients at our center. Again, somewhere around a year and a half, we see this sort of splitting of the curves. And if you look at it in a different fashion of, of both graft dysfunction or death, clearly African Americans have inferior outcomes here. <laughs> 
So even within our own institution, we're seeing that these black recipients have worse outcomes. And of course, the question is, why are these patients dying faster after transplant? So we're gonna spend a little bit of time just reviewing what is out there, uh, and then we'll show you what I think is uh, a potential source of this, these disparate outcomes. So um, the literature is pretty poor on the topic. There's really not a lot out there, um, but there's some interesting ideas. Certainly, the first of which is, could race mismatch play a role? In other words, uh, if a donor is white and a recipient is black or vice versa, does that affect survival post-transplant? Uh, interestingly, the, the first real study on this from 2009 came from across the street. Uh, Kirk Cantor and Bill Maley and some of the other names you probably recognize here looked at this in their pediatric population. Uh, and you can see they looked at about 169 patients. Again, a single center retrospective study the fair number of black transplant recipients, most of whom were race mismatched. Uh, the donor pool is primarily Caucasian, and, and you can see that here. Um, more white recipients were matched for race. And what did they find? Well, if you look at the black dots here, these are transplants that were matched by race, and down below the survival curve of transplants that were mismatched by race. And you can see clearly in, inferior survival um, free of retransplantation and the race mismatched uh, group. And when that was looked in a multivariable analysis, you can see uh, donor recipient race mismatch uh, was about twofold higher risk of death. Obviously, uh, this was a controversial paper to say that uh, we need to match race for transplant is a, is a pretty bold statement. Um, certainly met with a lot of scrutiny. Um, as you probably know or may not know, we don't match race uh, when we're doing transplant because there is thankfully additional data that's come out. Uh, again, large retrospective UNIS database analyses from this group at Hopkins. Looking at this in the adult population uh, of 20,000 patients that I already mentioned, uh, and what they found was really there was no difference. Their first question was, are organs from one race inherently inferior? So if, is, it the, is there a problem with a Caucasian heart? Is there a problem with a Hispanic heart at the time of donation? Uh, and they found that there was no difference. So it didn't matter. Uh, donor race was not a risk factor for poor outcomes. And so regardless of race, survival was the same. Uh, and then when they looked at matched and unmatched, uh, they found there was really no difference in, in survival, at least out to five years. You can see within the white recipient group, matched versus unmatched, even all the way out to five years, there was no significant difference in outcomes. Similarly, with African Americans and with Hispanic patients. I would point out that although there's no difference within the groups, you can see a clear difference in five-year survival between white and African American patients here at five years. So, um, Fortunately, it does not seem that race mismatch is uh, an important factor here. There have been some other studies that have come out to further prove this. Uh, as such, we do not uh, match organs by race, of course. How about socioeconomics? Um, obviously, this is you know, healthcare disparities and healthcare literacy play important roles and outcomes in any disease. Um, but really, it's even more important within the transplant population. And, could socioeconomic factors play a role in worse outcomes in African Americans? Well, I'm, you know, when we're rounding, I'm, I'm always telling the house staff, you know, finding out if someone's a transplant candidate for medical reasons is actually very easy. It's finding out whether they're a good candidate for psychosocial reasons, which is always the hard part. And when we have our discussions and our meetings, it's easy to determine medical candidacy. Most of the debate is around whether or not patients have the resources and the wherewithal to actually make a transplant work. And it takes a lot of resources to make it work. Financially, for example, if you look, the cost of inpatient, uh, inpatient costs in the first year post-transplant uh, on average is about $160,000. Uh, and then the cost of medications in the first year is about $13,000. So it does take resources to be able to pull that off. Uh, these patients are constantly having their medications changed. We check prograph levels, for example, and then we call them almost weekly sometimes to change their medications and uh, it's quite common for them to get confused about it. So these patients really 
have to be able to manage a complex medication regimen. Dr. Smith likes to say we're just trading one disease for another. In fact, most patients are actually on more medications after their transplant, and so they need to be able to take those medications. Uh, transportation resources are important. It's shocking how many patients can't get to and from our center, but it happens. And when you consider that, within the first month, we typically have them come back four times for a biopsy, including uh, clinic visits. They get 12 to 15 biopsies in the first year, and so they're coming back constantly, and many patients can't do that. And then they just have to have the wherewithal to be able to recognize signs and symptoms symptoms of issues and complications, and so some degree of understanding and cognitive ability is critical. Now, you know, determining the effects of socioeconomics on outcomes is not easy. Um, we sort of use surrogate markers, for example, education level. Uh, we use things like uh, government insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, to try to sort of, I guess, pigeonhole patients into whether or not they have uh, appropriate socioeconomic background. Uh, and the data is really sparse on this. Um, you can see here, again, these are from large registry studies. Looking at education and whether or not patients have Medicare or Medicaid as their primary payer. And you can see that African Americans have a, a much higher rate of Medicare and Medicaid use as primary payer and are less likely to have a college education. Uh, in these studies, having Medicaid was associated with higher risk of rejection and mortality, and Medicare was similar, although not significant. And then a lack of a college education was found to be a risk factor for rejection. Now, does that mean we can necessarily connect these? So we know African Americans are more likely to have Medicaid and Medicare, and are less likely to have a college education. Does that necessarily mean they have worse outcomes? Well, if you look by adding the Hispanic population in here, you see that actually the Hispanic population is more likely to have Medicare and Medicaid and less likely to have a college education. And yet when we look at outcomes in the Hispanic population, they are no different than the Caucasians. It's really just the African Americans here uh, who have the worst outcomes. So making that sort of two neuron connection of uh, race and Medicaid or race and college education, not necessarily straightforward. Uh, our own Alana Morris sort of looked at this a little bit further um, to sort of determine what role these factors play. She looked at uh, what's called population attributable risk, basically meaning she went within each race and said, how much of these factors actually account for graft failure after transplant? And what you can see is high school education or less and public insurance actually was a significant contributor, but it was in the white population. So it seemed to be uh, the white patients who did not have uh, insurance or had Medicare and Medicaid, or the white patients who had a lower education uh, that actually had the worst outcomes, and it was not a significant risk in the black or Hispanic population. So if, if nothing else, you know, based on the data that's out there, do socioeconomic factors play a role? They may, but at the level of granularity that we're able to see it, and the data that's available it doesn't necessarily seem to be the case, and I don't think we can say that that has 100% uh, uh, is the cause of, of disparate outcomes in these populations. How about pharmacogenomics? So there's some interesting data out there, and, and we notice um, pretty routinely clinically that getting African-American patients tacrolimus levels which is, again, our primary immunosuppressant, it's very difficult to get their levels in range oftentimes, and the question, of course, is why. Uh, and in fact, you know, African-American transplants typically receive a lot higher doses of tacrolimus, and the question is, does it have something to do with their biologic ability to metabolize it? And in theory, because of that, would they be at higher risk for rejection and poor outcomes? And this was a nice study uh, dating back now 15 years by Mandeep Mara when he was at Oshner uh, in New Orleans. He is now at Brigham and Women's. But he looked at this and was really the first to recognize this, that if you look at tacrolimus levels between black and white recipients at 3, 6, and 12 months, you can see at 6 and 12 months the tacrolimus levels were lower in the black transplant recipients, despite the fact that if you look at their mean daily dose, they're receiving about twice as much tacrolimus. And so despite getting twice as much tacrolimus, they're not getting therapeutic uh, as readily or as easily. And in theory, that could lead to uh, poor outcomes. Of course, the question is why. Uh, and there's some nice literature from the renal transplant um, uh, group showing that uh, 
Um, turns out there actually are differences in clearance. Uh, there are certain sort of genotypes of cytochrome P450-3A5, in particular the 3A5-1 genotype is associated with much higher tacrolimus clearance and lower bioavailability of the drug, such that if you have one allele of this 3A51 gene, you have a 36% reduction in your trough. And if you have two alleles, you've got about a 60% reduction in your trough, and you can see that here. That uh, is over time, uh, weeks post-transplant, based on the number of alleles you have. And it turns out when they looked at uh, what population has these alleles, about two-thirds of the African-American recipients had at least one allele uh, as opposed to only 8% of the non-African Americans. So um, while they didn't look at this directly in terms of how it affects outcomes, we know that low tacrolimus levels equal possible rejection and equal possible graft dysfunction and death. And so I think, although it's not entirely clear, certainly the fact that African Americans, uh, it can be more difficult to get them therapeutic, certainly could play a role uh, in their adverse outcomes long term. And that's something that we need to pay attention to moving forward. Um, how do we dose these patients? How do we make sure that their levels are therapeutic? So I gave that one a question mark as a possibility. So shifting gears to sort of what I'm interested in, and that's sort of looking at biologic or immune factors that may play a role in poor outcomes. In other words, are there immune, immunologic differences between the two groups that could explain this as opposed to socioeconomic factors or non-biological factors? Um, so. With all due respect to any immunologist in the room, I've dumbed down transplant immunology to a third grade reading level here. Um, it's about the, the best I can understand it. Um, but basically, when we're talking about rejection post-transplant, we're talking about essentially two arms of our immune system, which are really two sides of the same coin. Um, the vast majority of our understanding of rejection post-transplant uh, has to do with cell-mediated rejection, and that's the process by which uh, you get cytotoxic T-cell-induced damage to the myocardium as a result of exposure to the donor antigen. Uh, this is what essentially all of the research is focused on. This is why we biopsy patients every week. We look for T-cell infiltrates attacking the heart. Um, all of our uh, immunosuppressants target T-cell activation and proliferation, so our, our goals of immunosuppression are essentially to prevent cell-mediated rejection. Uh, and it really accounts for more than 90% of the rejection that we see. If you look, about 15% of patients are, are treated for this in the first year. And interestingly, graft function is typically preserved because we biopsy uh, the heck out of them in the first year to try to find this while they're still asymptomatic. Uh, there's sort of mixed data on whether there are racial differences in cellular rejection. Um, some papers suggest yes. Dr. Alana Morris, who works with us, had a nice paper showing about a 4% increased risk in African Americans. And yet there are a number of papers that, that suggest that the African American race is not a risk factor for cell mediated rejection. Um, my area of interest is on this other side over here, and that's antibody mediated rejection. And I will tell you, until about 10 years ago, many transplant uh, cardiologists, surgeons, and immunologists didn't actually believe this existed. And so it's a relatively new field uh, in the area of heart transplantation. The idea that you could develop an antibody response to the heart that could lead to uh, damage and destruction. And when we're talking about antibody mediated rejection, we're talking about the development of antibodies against donor HLA antigens. So everyone in the room has their own sort of HLA profile, and that's how your immune system identifies your, as yourself as opposed to someone else. And when you're exposed to someone else's HLA antigens, in theory, you can mount an immune response to that and develop antibodies against those antigens, which leads to antibody-mediated rejection, you can see here. And we see this under uh, microscopy as uh, sort of a capillaritis within the myocardium, uh, which stains positive, you can see here, for uh, C4D, which is a complement breakdown component. Component. So antibodies can lead to destruction by activation of complement and ultimately graft dysfunction. And this is sort of an area that I became interested in early in my career, primarily because no one really knew anything about it and no one knew or understood how it sort of came out uh, to, to affect outcomes. We now recognize that it probably accounts for about 10% of all rejection. And again, as I mentioned, we're looking at antibodies that target HLA antigens uh, of the donor heart. We have no idea how to treat it. When you consider uh, that it accounts for about 10% of rejection, 
each center has about 20 patients. Uh, so you're looking at maybe two or three patients at a center every year. Uh, and everybody has their own way of treating it. And as I mentioned, nobody collaborates on this stuff. So the best way to treat this is unknown and the effects of treatment on outcomes is also unknown. We do know that when it rears its ugly head, it's pretty dangerous. Uh, outcomes associated with it are poor. In fact, graft dysfunction is very common. And we know that once patients develop these antibodies, uh, their survival uh, becomes impaired. So my question was, uh, is there a role of, of uh, race in the development of this? In other words, are there predispositions in African Americans to develop antibodies post-transplant? And could this account for at least some degree of their disparate outcomes? Um, so just in terms of vocabulary, when we mount immune responses to HLA antigens, in the literature we call them de novo donor-specific antibodies, uh, meaning new antibodies uh, that are donor-specific, in other words, antibodies to the donor. So from here forth, I'm going to be using the term DSA um, when I'm talking about anti-HLA antibodies. The first question is, how common is this really? And again, this is pretty new literature. You can see all these are from the last sort of five or six years because Prior to that, there was no literature on this topic. Uh, turns out, if you look, as many as 30% of transplant recipients actually develop these antibodies. Um, the key is not all of them actually have problems. And figuring out who's going to have a problem with their antibodies or not, they don't all lead to antibody-mediated rejection. Only about half of them do. Uh, and so we spend a lot of time trying to figure out the patients who develop these antibodies, who's going to have a problem with it, who's not. But about 50% of them will go on to develop antibody-mediated rejection, which is associated with graft dysfunction uh, and, law and, and death. This was sort of a seminal paper uh, published now, I guess, six years ago, showing that. And this is really the first paper to show that outcomes are clearly worse when patients develop these de novo DSA. Uh, and you can see here in the dotted line, patients who develop DSA compared to those who do not, showing clearly inferior survival. Uh, and then a multivariable model, you, see, you can see it was over four times worse survival when patients develop these de novo antibodies. Now the next question, of course, is we know these things are bad. Could African Americans be at higher risk for developing these antibodies? And therefore, could this account for some of their worse outcomes? Uh, well, we know that African Americans are much more likely to have an HLA mismatch at the time of transplant, meaning they're more likely to get a heart with HLA antigens that are not similar to their own. And therefore, in theory, they're more likely to develop an immune response to that. The reason for that is because there's tremendous amount of polymorphism in the HLA antigens that are seen among African Americans. Uh, this graph here is actually from a review paper by Alana, looking at the frequency distribution of the top 25 most common HLA, A, B, and DR haplotypes, and you can see uh, the Caucasians uh, in this study have a high rate of these sort of more common antigens, whereas the African Americans have the lowest rate. And so the, the HLA profile within African Americans is very diverse, very heterogeneous, whereas the Caucasian population tends to be more homogenous. There are sort of some standard HLA profiles, HLA antigens that we see more commonly in Caucasians. And so because of this, um, African Americans who do receive transplant, whether it's from a, another African American or a Caucasian patient, are more likely to be exposed to HLA antigens that are not their own. And in theory, could be at higher risk for developing an antibody-mediated response to that. Uh, we sort of stumbled upon this in our own way, looking at something completely unrelated to race. Um, we were trying to identify whether or not certain antibodies to certain HLA antigens, specifically DQ antigens, were associated with worse outcomes. And we were just looking at sort of baseline demographics. Uh, we noticed that uh, black race seemed to be a significant risk factor, at least in this, this study, uh, for the development of de novo DSA, whether it's DQ or non-DQ. Uh, in fact, 62% of the, the African Americans in this study uh, developed uh, de novo donor specific antibodies, which sort of led to our next thought was, well, let's look at this more directly and say, do African Americans have higher risk for developing these antibodies? Uh, and therefore, are they at higher risk for antibody-mediated rejection and transplantation? 
Uh, and this is a paper that's now in press, um, and this was sort of some of the work that led to my, my FAME grant. You can see our very own single center retrospective study of 137 patients at our center. Uh, and about 48% of them were black and 71 non-black. We excluded patients that died within 30 days, and we had a median follow-up of about 3.7 years. And what we looked at as a primary endpoint was, do these patients develop DSA more commonly compared to non-black recipients? And then, does that lead to more antibody-mediated rejection, and therefore does it affect uh, graft function and survival? The baseline characteristics that are noteworthy is that the black population was younger by about 10 years, 45 versus 55. They had a shorter duration of follow-up. Um, they had a much higher rate of Medicare and Medicaid use, 54% versus 31%. Uh, and they were more likely to have a race mismatch, as has been shown in the literature, about 73% had a race mismatch compared to the Caucasian patients uh, baseline. Uh, adherence to immunosuppression uh, obviously could play a major role in whether or not patients develop an immune response. Unfortunately, it's really difficult to measure adherence to immunosuppression. Uh, it's not like patients are always forthcoming about whether or not they're taking their medications. So we tried to kind of look at this objectively to see if patients were adherent or not, at least over the first 18 months. Uh, one advantage to TACR limits, which we use, is you can actually measure levels of this stuff, and if patients come back with really low levels, it's suspicious that they could be non-adherent to their regimen. So we actually looked at that. We looked at the average TACR limits dose and average TACR limits level uh, over the first 6, 12, and 18 months. And what you can see here is that, as has been shown in other studies, the African Americans were on much higher doses of TACR limits, as we might suspect based on the uh, presence of the 3A51 genotype. Um, but we also saw that really the uh, mean tacrolimus levels were pretty similar. I will say there was a slight difference. Um, let me kind of push through these. There was a slight difference um, at the zero to six month period in TAC levels, such that African Americans did have a slightly lower uh, tacrolimus level. That's worth noting. The other thing that was interesting is that mycophenolate, which is sort of the other major immunosuppressant that we use, African Americans were on actually higher doses of mycophenolate uh, compared to Caucasians. So there were differences in the immunosuppression. The question is, does that account for uh, their outcomes? So what did we find first? Uh, just at the development of de novo DSA, overall about 29% uh, of the patients developed de novo DSA. Uh, with a medium time of about 1.8 years to developing it. Uh, and we did find that the black recipients were about three times as likely to develop DSA. Uh, in fact, 44% of the African Americans in our study over the study period developed antibodies uh, against HLA antigens. And when you look at this in the Kaplan-Meier curve, you can see uh, freedom from de novo DSA clearly inferior uh, in the black population. We did a Cox regression analysis looking at a number of variables um, whether it's, you know, the presence of or the use of Medicaid, Medicare, uh, gender, race, and so forth. And, and the multivariable model, black race, was associated with about a 3.6 times higher risk of developing de novo DSA post-transplant compared to non-blacks. Incidentally found was that LVAD as a bridge to transplant is also a risk factor. Uh, that makes sense. When patients get an LVAD uh, as a bridge to transplant, they oftentimes get a lot of blood products. Um, which can expose them to other people's HLA antigens. But black race was associated with a 3.6-fold higher risk. Now, does that translate into increased risk of rejection? Of course, the numbers are less. Only 19 patients were treated for antibody-mediated rejection uh, with a median time of treatment of two years. But again, we saw that the black recipients had a three-fold higher risk of being treated for antibody-mediated rejection during follow-up, 21% of them in this case. Here again, the Kaplan-Meier curves show a clear separation about one and a half to two years out from transplant. This seems to be the sort of vulnerable period in which these things tend to pop up. Uh, and again, in both univariate and multivariate analysis, black race was associated with a 4.8-fold uh, higher risk of being treated for AMR. And that was really the only risk factor of all the ones we identified here associated with it. Now, how does that affect outcomes? Does this lead to increased rates of graft dysfunction and death? Uh, 
Uh, over the study period, about 23% of our patients uh, died or developed graft dysfunction. And again, you see at that same time point on all these curves, sort of a split um, by race. Somewhere around a year and a half to two years, these curves tend to um, sort of dive off where African Americans have worse outcomes. And we looked at this, and in a univariate analysis, black race was associated with a twofold higher risk of death or graft dysfunction. Um, and you can see here the development of DSA was associated with about a five to six fold higher risk. Interestingly, when we put all this together in a multivariable model, race was no longer a risk factor for graft dysfunction or death, and turned out it was only the development of DSA. So the development of antibodies um, seems to be the number one cause of graft dysfunction or death in this population. So when you account for antibodies, race was no longer a factor. Uh, we've already alluded to the fact that African Americans have a much higher risk for developing these, and in theory, that could be why they have worse outcomes. One last slide looking at this was to break down patients based on race uh, and the development of antibodies. And you can see the purple and green curves are patients that develop antibodies. The purple curve being the black patients developing DSA, green being the non-black. And it turns out it didn't matter what your race was, you had worse outcomes if you develop antibodies. Uh, and then here you can see the groups that don't develop antibodies. Again, sort of highlighting that development of DSA is associated with worse outcomes. And it may not just be black race, but the fact that black patients have a higher risk of developing these antibodies. So our conclusion was that racial disparity could uh, certainly result from a propensity to develop antibodies, and which leads to subsequent antibody mediated rejection. Um, obviously, this is, again, another example of a single center analysis, retrospective small study, uh, which, as I mentioned, the transplant literature um, is basically completely comprised of. Uh, so my goal was to take this and turn it into a multi-center analysis, find people who are willing to collaborate, uh, which is not easy to do in the transplant community, um, and sort of look at this again in a multivariable analysis um, using multi-center analysis. And that was sort of the goal of my FAME grant was to try to uh, have some time carved out where we can do this. And uh, we have a number of investigators already on board. Um, Pollock Shah, who's at INOVA, Kara Shah uh, in Richmond at VCU, Anu Lala at Mount Sinai, and, and our very own Danny Sims, who was here previously, who's now up at Montefiore. All have agreed uh, to participate. Uh, we already have data collected from Pollock and CARE. Uh, and we're just waiting on um, the rest of the results from the other two centers. And hopefully, we can actually have what will probably be the largest transplant study uh, of any outcome outside of a registry uh, that's ever been put together, which is shocking considering uh, there have been 40,000 transplants in the US since its origin. But, and then hopefully, our goal is to take that. And, and sort of form a collaboration, a sort of a transplant consortium where we can move forward uh, with doing other research projects and ideas with shared data across these centers to hopefully actually impact outcomes. Now, what are we going to do if we confirm these findings, which I suspect we will, at least preliminarily based on adding two centers into the data, if the, the data only grows stronger? Um, how can we mitigate the risk of developing antibodies in African Americans post-transplant. Clearly, the current immunosuppression models are, are, are inadequate. The regimens that we're using uh, don't seem to help or, or don't seem to be able to allay the risk of DSA development. So the question is, is there another drug out there that we could potentially use? Uh, and some of you may be familiar with this Belatacip drug, also called Neulogix. Uh, this is a drug that was actually invented here at Emory. Uh, doctors Pearson and Larson, the transplant surgeons, uh, did a lot of work on this drug, developing it, and it's actually used quite commonly in the renal transplant population. Uh, the advantage to this drug, there are many advantages to it. Um, it uh, does not cause hypertension, does not cause diabetes, and it does not cause renal failure or kidney damage, which for those of you who have worked with tacrolimus know that that's the major issue with it. Renal failure, hypertension, and diabetes. Uh, which can obviously affect long-term outcomes in these patients. And so they've been transitioning a lot of their patients off of tacrolimus-based regimens over to Belatacip uh, to try to spare their renal function, uh, reduce their risks of hypertension and diabetes. 
Uh, but what I'm most interested in is their seven-year data, which was published about a year ago in the New England Journal, showed that actually Belatacet was associated with a much lower risk for the development of de novo DSA. So if you look at a cyclosporin-based regimen or even a tacrolimus-based regimen, which are calcineurin inhibitors, uh, they saw about an 11 to 12 percent risk of developing DSA. And when you look at the Belatacet arms, there was statistically significantly lower risk taken together about a 2% risk of developing HLA antibodies post-transplant, uh, which I think is particularly exciting and potentially an opportunity to bring that drug into the heart transplant world and see if this could affect patients uh, long term, especially those who seem to be at highest risk for antibodies, uh, namely the African American population. So our goal is to sort of replicate uh, what we found in the single center analysis with a multi-center study and if that's confirmed, potentially try to move forward with an actual clinical trial, which is not common in transplant, as you can imagine, uh, a multicenter clinical trial looking at the use of this novel agent to see how it affects long-term outcomes uh, related to DSA and graft dysfunction. So um, I'll finish uh, here and take time for questions. I'll just point out, hopefully you, you garnered from this that African Americans do have worse outcomes um, post-transplant in terms of survival and graft function. Uh, Emory is uniquely situated to address this issue in that, as I pointed out, we have the highest rates of African-American transplant in probably the world, and that will continue to be the case. Uh, DSA and subsequent antibody-mated rejection may play a key role. I don't think we can uh, conclude that based on a single center study. Uh, but hopefully with our multi-center study, you know, when you look back, you know, that single center study suggested we should be race matching patients at the time of transplant. Obviously, we don't do that because follow-up data showed that that was not the case. So hopefully we'll be able to look at this uh, soon with our multi-center analysis. And really, uh, transplantation, I think it's going to have a difficult time moving forward unless we start collaborating with other centers. Uh, thankfully, we found a number of places that are interested in this, and we're moving forward with that. And hopefully, we can build some relationships with these other sites and, and have some meaningful research going forward. And, and again, future studies will really need to look at novel therapies because what we're doing right now seems to be failing uh, for our African-American population. And on that note, I will take questions. This is the last picture of Grutcher Hospital. This is Mr. Washkansky, a model of him after his transplant. Uh, looking good here. Uh, just a historical note, uh, they really played up the, the uh, PR on this. They actually took this poor guy out of his bed and put him on a, on a float and took him out to the water to make it look like he was doing well and playing out on the beaches um, after his transplant. Uh, and of course, as I mentioned, he passed away about 18 days after his transplant. Okay, with that, I'll take any questions you might have. So that was fantastic. Um, it's, it certainly is an interesting um, thing to think about that there's more genetic variation within race than between race, yet there are these, you know, sort of interesting sort of things that pop up that are common and, you know, we think about lupus and autoimmune diseases and lupus and things like that. So fundamentally, any idea what the actual, what, what's the actual underlying mechanism of this or thing that's actually driving this? The, the development of the, of the automated? Yeah, you know, I think, um, I don't know, I'll say that, um, but I think it's an area that we can look at. We, um, Pollock Shaw, that is part of this study group, does a lot of work uh, with NIH and looking at a variety of things uh, related to genetic predispositions and things, and uh, uh, it's certainly something we'll address, but I, I don't have an answer for that. We do know that, you know, Clearly, their HLA profiles from a, from a transplant perspective are very diverse. You know, I, I actually spent time t looking at these 137 patients and pulled out all of their HLA profiles, and uh, it's, it's pretty striking how different the HLA profiles are in African-American recipients. And so um, when they are exposed to these foreign antigens, one, they're more likely to be exposed to a foreign antigen. The question is, why do they have propensity to generate antibodies to it more so? And that's what I don't know. I, I can see why they're at higher risk, but um, everybody, I mean, the, the median number of mismatches at time of transplant is five. So, 
most patients are horribly mismatched at the time of heart transplant. And so uh, you'd think everybody would be at the, uh, equal risk of developing these, but clearly they're not. And that, I don't know why that's the case. It's something we'll have to figure out. Man. Great, very nice presentation. Question, clinically, is it the vasculopathy that is the most common that kills them? Yeah, so the antibodies can sort of have a number of different effects. One is they can cause direct uh, complement-mediated toxicity uh, where they activate complement and cause destruction to the tissues. Uh, but they also can develop sort of this chronic inflammatory changes, which tends to start out as a capillaritis in the endothelial cells of the, of the capillary bed, uh, but then can progress to involve the coronaries. And that's what we think is a risk factor for the coronary disease we see in these transplant patients called CAV, which is more of an immune-mediated process. So uh, it sort of has its effects two ways, through acute rejection and then also through a chronic uh, development of coronary disease and it's probably a mix um, and it depends on where you look at it. For example, uh, out in LA at Cedar sinai they transplant a lot of high-risk patients who already have antibodies to the donor when they put the heart in and they see a lot more sort of acute antibody mediated rejection and toxicity whereas here at our center we're a lot more conservative so we see less of the true direct cytotoxicity related to antibodies um, and actually see more of this sort of transplant vasculopathy. And that's something that we're teasing out. The problem is my average follow-up was only 3.7 years. I think as we go further out, we'll see that a lot of these patients are probably developing coronary disease at a much higher rate as well, uh, which may account for some of the long-term uh, disparity. Yeah. Do you think with the drug-coated balloons, that may offer a better option to these patients than placing metal in these coronary arteries? Certainly possible. I think um, that's something that hopefully we can work with you to figure out maybe going forward. There's, it's an area ripe for research uh, for a variety of reasons, but clearly once patients develop CAV, their prognosis is, is tremendously impaired also. And so that's sort of the, the single biggest limitation to long-term transplant survival, and we still don't know the best way of fixing it. Uh, we like to think that we're helping with changing our immunosuppressants to things like serolimus-based, uh, and certainly we stint them when we can, but uh, it's an aggressive disease that is difficult to halt, and so we're always looking for, for new reasons to, or, or new ways to fix that. Yeah. Any other questions? I was curious whether any of the work that's been done looking at inflammatory markers, mm -hmm. you know, in coronary disease or other kinds of things, has that been done kind of pre-transplant to characterize, are there... Are there any kind of obvious predictors pre-transplant of who's going to do well and poorly, and does any of that in theory? Just generally speaking? This? Yeah, right, I mean, it, yeah. You know, I guess one big question is, is this the host or is it the donor? Yeah. Right? And, and, and is, there any, is there anything that's been done looking at kind of inflammatory markers pre-transplant mm -hmm. as risk predictors generally? Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, we certainly, um, Pratik Sanitara and a, a number of residents have actually um, have some some stuff we're looking at, looking at a variety of inflammatory biomarkers after transplant and patients who have not yet developed things like coronary disease to see if they might predict future events. Uh, SUPAR, for example, and a number of other ones um, that we're working on now, we're, it's sort of in process, but we don't, we don't have pre-transplant data to say at the time of transplant going in, is there something specific? Certainly, they're all pretty uh, in, inflamed going into the OR, but so it might be tough, but um, it is an interesting, interesting thought since all of this is inflammatory mediated. But, you know, for what it's worth, we're going to try to take patients who have already been transplanted, look at their sort of baseline levels of these things, and look over time, do they have more events? But, you know, it's a good question. Okay. I think we finished early. All right. Thanks so much. That was great. Yeah.